Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to BMT311 Immunology. Um, we're going to go into our fifth lecture in part two, uh, which covers allergies and hypersensitivities. Um, so in the last lecture, we talked about um, immunological tolerance, and, and there's some links to allergies with that, is with whether or not our immune system is able to um, uh, regulate to reduce uh, an over response to things that are potentially harmless. And in, in this lecture, we talk about our over immune response towards things that are harmless, um, which then results in what we know to be allergies and hypersensitivities. So <clears throat> at the end of this lecture, um, uh, you're expected to be able to describe and distinguish the four main types of hypersensitivities. Uh, specifically, type 1 hypersensitivity, we'll spend a bit more time on, uh, and we're going to talk about the role of IgE. Uh, and then we'll talk some more about the characteristics and management of different hypersensitivities and allergies. So first, what are hypersensitivities? Um, they are basically disorders that result from inappropriately vigorous, innate, or adaptive response to antigens that pose little or no threat. So it shouldn't really harm us, but our immune system recognizes it as um, threatening and so they respond and over respond and damage our tissues uh, in the process. So the most common form of hypersensitivity is allergy and it was first described by a pediatrician named Clemens Vond uh, where he observed that the response to some antigens actually damage the host rather than result in a protective response. And the most familiar type of allergies result from uh, the production of IgE antibodies and they, these are what we call type 1 reactions. And these include reactions uh, such as that to poison ivy, so this type of leaf that makes you have a rash, uh, and they result from T cell mediated uh, uh, type for uh, responses. So type type one hypersensitivity reactions are initiated by uh, interaction between IgE and a multivalent antigen. So usually in healthy people, there's not a lot of IgE in the serum, and it's only made when you have a parasite infection, so as we mentioned in the earlier lecture. Um, but some people who are atopic uh, are more likely to generate IgE antibodies against common environmental antigens. So these include things like pollen, seafood, eggs, uh, and certain antibiotics or insect products as well, or even some vaccines. So the, the factors that distinguish uh, allergenic from non-allergenic molecules is so why is it that some molecules are likely to trigger a type 1 hypersensitivity? Is one, whether or not they have enzymatic activity um, that can affect the cell and molecules of the immune system. So for example, uh, allergens from dust mites or cockroaches have high protease activity. So these can disrupt uh, the integrity of epith epithelial cell junctions and allow them to access the underlying cells which can trigger the immune response. Um, or if these uh, uh, enzymatic activities can cleave or activate the complement, or they can stimulate uh, protease-activated receptors on, on immune cells, which causes uh, inflammation. Uh, or some of these allergens actually have potential uh, PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. So these, as we know, will trigger the innate immune response. Um, and if uh, these uh, allergens enter via the mucosal tissue at very low concentrations, these also tend to produce a, a, a Th2 response, which causes an IgE production. So let's talk about IgE. So IgE antibodies are not destructive. I mean, they're good. That's how we deal with uh, parasites. But they can cause hypersensitivity when they bind to the FC receptors um, expressed on mast cells, basophils, and eosinophils. And when this happens, they induce degranulation, which means the granulocytes will release their contents, such as histamine, heparin, and protease, into the blood. Um, where uh, by activated granulocytes will release leukotrienes and prostaglandins and other cytokines and all together they'll start uh, wreaking havoc on the surrounding tissues which then causes your allergy symptoms. Um, so the IgE half-life is only two to three days usually but when it's bound to the receptor, the, that FC um, uh, epsilon receptor, um, it can actually be stable for weeks so it can cause you a lot of uh, pain. Um, and there are two different types of these receptors. There's the high affinity receptor, which is responsible for most of the allergy symptoms, and then you've got the lower affinity receptor, which regulates the production of the IgE um, by the B cells as, it trans as well as its transport. Um, so let's look at this uh, receptor a bit more closely. 
So the type 1 receptor is actually expressed in a high level in mast cells and basophils, and this is the one that binds IgE with high affinity. Um, so the, the IgE-mediated signaling begins when the allergen crosslinks the IgE that is bound to these receptors, uh, whereas the type 2 has lower affinity for IgE. And when the soluble uh, CD23 binds to the surface uh, of the IgE synthesizing B cells, this uh, amount, this IgE is synthesis is increased. But when it's bound to the CD23, when it's bound to the uh, soluble IgE, then the IgE synthesis uh, is suppressed. Um, so basically what happens is, um, okay, so this picture kind of shows you um, the action um, of the B cells which produces the allergen specific IgE now binding to the sensitized mast cell which causes the degranulation and all those um, leukotrienes and cytokines that will um, have action on different, different tissues. Um, but one thing uh, to note is that it has to be a sensitized mast cell. So we, we don't develop allergies to things we've never been exposed to before. Uh, so we'll talk about that in, in a bit. And this um, shows again um, that degranulation and mast cell and activation, which, which um, causes inflammation on, on these different cell types. Um, these are the cytokines that we're talking about, and these are their primary actions, and they're the ones that are produced uh, when the um, granulocytes degranulate. Um, <clears throat> so in the process of producing a type 1 response, you've got basically early phase and a late phase. Um, so the early phase is the immediate phase, and it occurs within minutes of the allergen exposure and it results in the release of those uh, histamines and leukotrienes. The late phase is the one that occurs hours after the early phase subsides, and this induces a localized inflammation. So the cytokines uh, tumor necrosis factor and uh, interleukin-1 from the mast cells will increase the expression uh, of the cell adhesion molecules, uh, which then allow all the neutrophils and eosinophils uh, and Th2 cells to come in. Uh, in the skin, you'll also have a third phase, which is um, basically characterized by a massive eosinophil infiltration, uh, in contrast to the second phase, which actually has basophils uh, coming in. So this is basically uh, the characteristics of the early response and the characteristics of the, the late response, where you have more types of cells uh, entering. Um, yeah, so this is another schematic just showing um, how multiple Im uh, immune cells are involved in the uh, chronic type 1 hypersensitivity uh, in mice. Um, so the categories of allergic reactions can be two main ones, which is systemic, systemic anaphylaxis and localized hypersensitive reaction. Anaphylaxis, uh, you may know, is probably the worst kind of uh, hypersense, type 1 hypersensitivity. And it's basically uh, translated from Greek as against protection. So it's not protecting. <laughs> um, and this describes the overreaction of the immune system. And, and this was actually uh, termed by Paul Poitier and Charles Richet uh, when they saw that the dogs they were testing with um, some toxins from uh, a jellyfish, they were trying to make a vaccine. Um, actually resulted in the dogs dying uh, in, in, in the booster dose. So if you remember from the earlier lectures, you usually have a primary response when you give the first uh, vaccine dose, and then the secondary response will actually give uh, a more protective uh, response later on. But in this case, the booster dose or the second dose ended up killing uh, the dog um, because of severe anaphylaxis. Um, and this systemic uh, anaphylaxis is basically a shock-like and uh, often fatal um, response that occurs within minutes of exposure. Things like uh, your, your respira respiration will drop, your blood pressure will drop, your smooth muscles will start contracting, and you'll start doing all of these involuntary actions like pooping and peeing and um, you cannot breathe. Um, so that, that obviously can be fatal if it's not treated, and it can occur within two to four minutes. Uh, of being exposed to allergen. So people who have very severe allergies uh, to things like uh, peanuts or eggs, if they accidentally uh, ingest that, um, usually they'll need to be treated with epinephrine uh, very quickly to counteract the effect of uh, the 
histamines and leukotrienes that are released so that um, they can uh, survive the uh, anaphylactic shock. Um, the more common type of type 1 hypersensitivity is usually localized, so this, this is more for specific target tissues, um, and it can be things like uh, rhinitis, so that's when you have all the um, like cold-like symptoms, when you have hay fever. Uh, asthma is also, in a sense, a form of hypersensitivity, eczema on the skin, or a certain type of food allergies. Uh, the most common one is uh, hay fever or allergic rhinitis, and this is when we inhale pollens or dust or any viral antigens that overstimulates and causes us to tear up, have a runny nose, be sneezing and coughing. So I have, I have, you know, in Malay we call it like you usually say resdong, and it, everything gets itchy and watery. And it's usually that's the, the allergic rhinitis. Um, then you've also got allergic a allergic asthma, so that's triggered by the degranulation of the mast cells. Um, but instead of occurring up here, it actually develops uh, in the lower respiratory tract, which gives you some uh, breathing difficulties. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the allergic eczema. It's a very common condition as well, often seen in young children. And basically what they have is uh, reddish skin eruptions that can become pus-like. And if they um, don't treat it, it can cause a bacterial infection as well. Um, food allergies are very common. So that's also a type 1 allergy. So it occurs in about 6 to 8% of children and infants. Uh, a lot of it are proteins uh, such as cow's milk, eggs, peanuts, soy, uh, fish, seafood. Um, and for, for adults, usually nuts, fish, and shellfish. Um, and the major food allergens are usually water-soluble glycoproteins that are stable to heat acid and they digest very slowly. So they can act as adjuvants. And if you remember, adjuvants are what causes uh, or stimulates the uh, innate uh, immune system and promotes inflammation, uh, and in this case also the Th2 response. So the allergens will cross-link the IgE of the mast cells on the upper GI tract. So you start having uh, symptoms like vomiting or diarrhea and some, uh, some pain. Um, but some, some people also have asthmatic attacks uh, when they eat certain foods that they're allergic to. Uh, or they'll, they'll develop rashes uh, or atopic urticaria, which people also call hives, um, when the, the food allergen is carried to the mast cells in the skin. Um, so there's some more examples in the table if you want to read. Um, so what are the factors that um, sort of uh, predispose to type 1 hypersensitivity? So genetics plays a very huge role. Um, so there are some genes uh, that code for proteins that involve in the regulation of the responsiveness and also proteins for airway remodeling. Um, then there's also the hygiene hypothesis. So some people believe that the exposure to pathogens when um, during infancy or in youth actually helps us um, establish a healthy balance of um, T cell activities so that it's not over responsive from one side. Um, so newborn babies may be biased to TH2, so remember they can be quite tolerant um, by the uterine environment. And if you keep an environment too, too clean, for example, they won't have the necessary exposure to make them more robust against, other aller uh, against potentially harmless um, allergens. Yeah, so this is just some examples of the products of genes that uh, are exhibiting polymorphisms. So the polymorphisms is basically um, how it different uh, it might manifest in different people, and that will give the person a predisposition or a likelihood to develop allergies. Um, for diagnostics and treatment, type 1 is usually assessed by just skin testing. So it's in inexpensive and quite safe, and you can test multiple antigens. So what, what is done is the physician will put um, some of the um, allergens, um, and then they'll see if this welt uh, develops uh, after uh, 30 minutes. And they'll compare that to histamine as well as saline. So histamine is your positive control, and then saline is your negative control. So there's no welt for saline, there's a welt for histamine, and then these are all the other things that this uh, poor individual is also allergic to, uh, unfortunately. Another method also is also using um, immunoassays like lysas or western blots. So how do we manage and treat uh, allergies? Well, the first thing, the best thing is to avoid allergies, uh, avoid the allergens. 
So if you know you are allergic to the peanuts, do not eat peanuts, uh, avoid places that may have peanuts. Um, or uh, there's also another method called hyposensitization. Um, sometimes there can be repeated exposure uh, in increasing doses of the allergens, which over time can eliminate the symptoms, sort of like a conditioning uh, of the immune system to tolerate more and more um, this, this allergen. Um, or we can use antihistamines, which then bind and locks the histamine receptors and reduces the symptoms. Um, or uh, inhalation corticosteroids, so that, that also helps uh, reduce some of the symptoms. Um, or liquitrine antagonists. So all of these address uh, those uh, cytokines and histamines to reduce the symptoms. So the second type of uh, hypersensitivity is antibody-mediated hypersensitivity. And this uh, is uh, involving other classes of antibodies other than IgE. So if you can remember that uh, immunoglobulin subclasses can activate the complement system, uh, which then creates pores in the membranes of a foreign cell. Uh, and then this is basically called antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity, or ADCC. Um, so what the antibodies do is they act as opsonins or markers to allow for phagocytes to come and ingest um, the targeted um, a foreign cell or, or antigen. So there are three main types of type 2 reactions. So one is transfusion reactions, two, hemolytic disease of newborns, and then three, hemolytic anemia. And this can be induced by things like antibiotics, um, which then cause the antibodies to bind to the red blood cells and cause complement to destroy the red blood cells, which causes anemia. Um, so for transfusion reactions, it's because of the compatibility uh, of the blood type antigens. So these blood type antigens are um, ABH and they're carbohydrates. And so the antibodies against these antigens are called isohemagglutinins. And so if a person uh, is a type A and then they're transfused with blood containing type B, a transfusion reaction occurs because the type B, uh, the anti-B uh, will bind to the blood cells. The anti-B in, in the type A individual will bind to the B blood cells and then the blood cells uh, in um, side will then be um, destroyed through complement mediated lysis. Um, so what happens is you'll have a massive intravascular hemolysis and the blood cells will start um, uh, be, being filtered uh, through the kidneys so you'll start seeing blood in the urine um, and uh, there will be also metabolization of the hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobin, which causes bilirubinemia. And so you might get fever, chills, nausea, so uh, all these symptoms that occur uh, when you have a transfusion reaction. Um, so the, this example is showing um, basically the blood type. So the gr group A will have the anti-B and the type A antigen. Uh, group B will have the uh, type B antigen and then anti-A. Group AB will have no none of the antibodies because they have both A and B antigens. And group O will have anti-A and anti-B um, and none of the, the antigens. And as we know, the AB is the universal acceptor and the O is the universal donor. Um, so... Um, the other type of type 2 reaction is the hemolytic disease of the newborn, and this also relates to the uh, antigens, um, but this one is the racist uh, antigen. And the D allele of the racist antigen is the most immunogenic and considered uh, Rh positive. So if the mother carrying the child has IgG antibodies that are Rh negative, um, and they're specific, uh, they'll be specifically targeting the red, the fetal blood group antigens that are Rh positive. So they'll cross the placenta and destroy the fetal red blood cells in the second pregnancy. Um, so again, it, it doesn't occur the first time in exposure, but the second time um, it, it will manifest, uh, the symptoms will manifest. So the symptoms are mild to severe anemia or jaundice, uh, which can be treated by UV light. So this, this picture shows um, basically how it works. So in the first pregnancy, you've got the uh, baby carrying red blood cells with the Rh positive and the mother is Rh uh, negative. So when the mother delivers the baby, um, then uh, the Rh specific B cells will be stimulated and they'll make antibodies against the Rh. 
um, and then the memory cells will stay. And then if the mother gets pregnant again and the baby is again Rh positive, um, then this time the memory B cells will um, very quickly uh, attack um, the baby's red blood cells uh, in the womb, um, which will cause a condition called erythroblastosis fetalis. So how this can be prevented is by treating the mother with Rogam, um, which prevents the B-cell activation and the memory cell formation. So they won't develop any of these antibodies that can destroy the red blood cells of the second baby. And this is usually given uh, around 28 weeks of pregnancy uh, uh, and within 24 to 48 hours after the first delivery. Another type of site sensitivity is type 3. So this is the immune complex mediated hypersensitivity. Um, and as we know, um, when an antibody a reacts with an antigen, usually they form immune complexes. But these are usually cleared. Um, when they're not cleared, then they, they stick around and they deposit in blood vessels or tissues. And when they stick around too long, this is what leads to uh, type 3. Sorry, my nose is a bit itchy today. Um, so if the antigens are capable of producing a lot of antigen antibody lattices or complexes, or if there's a lot of affinity for particular tissues, and the, all these complexes will start sticking um, in these, these specific tissues. Um, and this will then uh, bind to mast cells and neutrophils and macrophages, and they will trigger all those vasoactive mediators and inflammatory cytokines. So it will constantly cause a localized inflammation wherever it's being deposited. So then you'll get symptoms like fever, urticaria, a joint pain, a lymph node enlargement, protein in the urea. So if the antigen in the immune complex is an autoantigen, it can't be eliminated, then it becomes a type 3 hypersensitivity that cannot be easily resolved. So one example of this is uh, systematic lupus erythematous, but there are a lot of other autoimmune diseases that are also a type of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction like multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, which we'll cover in the next lecture. So this is also an example of another type 3 called the Arthus reaction. So um, when an antigens are interjected, uh, injected intradermally, the antigens will diffuse uh, and then start forming a large immune complexes with the antibodies and they'll start precipitating near the injection site. Um, so you'll have um, like a very bad rash uh, called the Arthus reaction about four to ten hours after the injection. So this can also happen due to insect bites, um, for example. Um, and then finally, the last type is the type 4 delayed type hypersensitivity. Uh, previously, it was called uh, a tuberculin reaction by uh, Robert Koch, um, the uh, famous scientist who discovered uh, the TB bacteria, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, and tuberculin is obviously um, preparation from, from the uh, TB. Um, so the hallmarks of a type 4 reaction are that it's initiation by T cells instead of antibodies and the delay uh, required for reaction to develop and it involves macrophages um, instead of neutrophils or eosinophils. Um, so it, uh, one example is contact dermatitis uh, like poison ivy um, or uh, when you have infection with intracellular pathogens. So, so an example is uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So that granuloma that forms that we talked about a couple of lectures ago, that's actually a delayed type uh, hypersensitivity or, or type 4 hypersensitivity. Uh, other intracellular bacteria can also cause this. So uh, delayed type hypersensitive response. First, you have the initial sensitization by the antigen. And then one to two weeks, uh, the antigen-specific T cells are activated and expand. And the APCs will start inducing the delayed type hypersensitive response, specifically the Langerhans cells and the macrophages. Um, so a second exposure to the antigen will then induce the effector phase. So the T cells will then start secreting a lot of cytokines to recruit more uh, macrophages and other inflammatory cells. And um, this usually occurs about 24 hours after the second contact with the antigen, and then it will peak about uh, 48 to 72 hours. Um, and that's usually uh, what, what in TB would cause uh, that formation of the uh, granuloma. Um, so this is the example uh, there where you have a lot of the multinucleated giant cells and the T cells and the intracellular uh, bacteria within the activated uh, within the macrophages 
um, and surround it by the activated uh, macro edges. So it, it is actually still a damaging type of response. It will damage the blood vessels and lead to tissue necrosis. Um, so on the, on, the, on the one hand, for intracellular pathogens like TB, this DTH response uh, will allow it, it to contain the spread. But um, at, over time, the concentrated enzymes uh, will actually cause damage to the tissues, the lung tissues as well. Right. Uh, so I think this is, I, usually I do a quiz, but let's just have a quick recap. Um, type 1, this is a good table for you to remember uh, when you're revising. So we, we know that type 1 is basically mediated by IgE. And what happens is the IgE will cross-link and bind to mast cells to release vasoactive mediators. So this can manifest as systematic, uh, a systemic anaphylaxis or localized anaphylaxis like hay fever, asthma, and, and the like. Um, IgG or IgM, uh, this is the mediator for type 2. So this is where um, there is destruction of cells due to the complement activation or uh, antibody-dependent uh, cellular cytotoxicity. Um, and this can include uh, things like transfusion reactions or erythrobastosis fetalis uh, when you have that RH uh, incompatibility between the mother and the baby, especially for the second baby, uh, as well as autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So the type 3 uh, hypersensitivity, we talked about this being immune complexes. So instead of IgE, um, this is antibody uh, antigen um that will complex and then deposit um, and then will start triggering uh, inflammatory responses and infiltration of neutrophils. So this can uh, manifest as well as autoimmune diseases uh, if it's there long term like rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. And then finally we talked about delayed type hypersensitivity which unlike the other three is mediated by T cells instead of antibodies. Um, so again, you've got IgE for type 1, IgG and IgM. So the IgG binds to the IgM actually. Um, and then type 3 antibody antigen complexes and then type 4 the T cells. So this, this is when synthesized T cells uh, release cytokines to uh, activate macrophages which then um, cause some kind of uh, damage to the tissues. Um, which is a double-edged sword. It can be protective when it's intracellular pathogens but can be destructive to the tissues. Okay, so that's about it. Um, see you in the next lecture.